As we are waiting on the outcome of the lawsuit Jacobson filed against P. Nass and Christopher Clack, I wanted to show you a fundamental flaw that should force the authors of the 100% renewable thesis for the U.S. to retract their paper. Today we are examining the following paper, Low-Cost Solution to the Grid Reliability Problem with 100% Penetration of Intermittent Wind, Water and Solar for All Purposes, which was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, which is one of the most prestigious scientific papers in the world. Here we see the flaw in the thesis. This is figure 4. The so-called load match model requires a delta of 1.3 terawatt hours per hour to maintain enough generation for the grid. It's quite simple. To achieve this, you need 1.3 terawatts of capacity, or 1300 gigawatts. I've tried to get the data of this load match model, but at this moment I'm stuck because my contacts within Stanford University are not keen on requesting that information. This is a telling sign. People are afraid of Jacobson. And this is bad for science in general. Because right now, trying to be a part of the discussion is tantamount to putting yourself in the crosshairs and submitting yourself to the possibility of litigation and even ruin. Let's state this for the record. I've written a book about the 100% WWS madness, and it is far more critical of Jacobson than Clack's work was. The question here, should I be afraid as well? Who knows, but since he already dismissed me as a non-science person, I feel free to do what I deem is necessary. Apart from that, the discussion about these all-or-nothing scenarios should be settled as we can demonstrate that any 100% strategy augmented with other technologies such as nuclear will show steeper decarbonization pathways and faster economic growth. Working as hard as possible to end poverty is essential. Back to the issue at hand. The load match model depends on 1300 gigawatts of hydro capacity, where about 85 gigawatts exists. It is assumed that these 1300 gigawatts are available when electricity from variable renewables is unavailable. 1300 gigawatts is roughly 15 times more than 85 gigawatts. I'm going to round up and down to keep it as clear as possible. I like to use the Hoover Dam as an example. A dam works on the Newtonian principle of the conservation of energy. Power delivery comes from turbines which are located well below the water surface of the reservoir. We can deduce the power delivered with this formula. For the Hoover Dam, these figures are as follows. And this gives us 3.5 million watts or 3.5 thousand megawatts in potential power delivered. However, the turbines are not 100% efficient. At 70% efficiency, they would be able to deliver roughly 2400 megawatts. Today, however, the plant is rated at 2080 megawatts, probably because the metrics have changed somewhat thanks to the lower water levels of Lake Mead. There are probably thousands of dams in the US, and it is unlikely that these could be adapted to serve as energy storage units. So these dams are probably out, save a handful. Let's try to stretch Hoover Dam's capacity by 15 times. As far as I can tell, we can do this in two ways. We could create tunnels in the rocks next to the dam, branching out into newly created powerhouses at the bottom of the dam. 19 turbines have been installed with a total capacity of 2080 megawatts. By this measure, we would have to add 266 more turbines. Additionally, we could stagger the turbines, the, but the amount of turbines needed would increase even more owing to the fact that with each turbine added, you reset one of the metrics, and this gain is probably not worth the investment. Here is a rough breakdown of the capital costs of dam construction. This is a quote. The civil works associated with the dam slash reservoir account for just over one quarter of the costs, while penstocks, trail races and tunneling add another 14%. The powerhouse 
shafts and electromechanical equipment together account for 30% of the total costs. The first thing to note here is that the reference for this diagram is Black and Veatch 2012, which is also used by Jacobson. When we take the EIA's figure for overnight costs for hydroelectric power at 2.4 million US dollars per megawatt and use 74% of that figure to augment the dams, we get a cost of 1.8 million US dollars per megawatt of additional capacity. We need 15 times the capacity as it has today. But we already know the final figure. It's 1300 gigawatts minus 85 gigawatts, which gives us 1215 gigawatts. So it will cost us 2.16 trillion US dollars. So here's the breakdown of capacity required for Jacobson's plan to decarbonize the US plus the EIA figures for overnight cost of each technology. So here we see that the total cost of the plan would, would be roughly 15 trillion in US dollars. Omitted are the 2.16 trillion dollars to augment existing dams, if possible. And this is not even looking at technical feasibility. This is just showing you how much Jacobson has omitted in terms of money. That's a huge margin of error, so big in fact that the entire thesis should be retracted. And this is not even taking into consideration whether we have enough water stored to begin with, what the accounting for withdrawal and replenishment looks like. For instance, the flow rate would have to be enhanced from 2 million liters per second to 30 million liters per second for the Hoover Dam alone. What would the impact downstream be? Is it even possible to discharge that much water? What would it do to the water level in Lake Mead and all the other reservoirs? There are countless of unanswered questions not even taken into consideration by Jacobson and his co-authors. And there you have it, yet another brief explanation why Jacobson's thesis should be retracted. But not only that, why Jacobson should withdraw his lawsuit against Pinas and Christopher Clack. Precisely because they have done what is expected from modest academics. They have tried to make the science work, but couldn't and therefore have submitted papers to contest the findings of Jacobson. And if you value honest scientific inquiry and want to learn alongside me, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon. First, I wish Christopher Clack, Ken Caldera and Pinas success in the days to come. May justice prevail. Second, a shout out to Ben Reed and Kirsten Murray Zeitz for their support. I'm incredibly grateful for what you've done to support me and my family. I wish you a very warm and happy holiday season. And to the rest of you, thank you for watching and have a nice day.